right, in this video we're going to do a little bit more compare and contrast with some different kinds of line integrals. So just to kind of review the different types of line integrals that we've done, when we first started we just did line integrals of a function along a curve and so the we partitioned the curve, the little pieces of the partition were arc length and so this is just kind of an ordinary line integral and then we did two different applications of line integrals where we were looking at line integrals in vector fields so we did the work integral and the flux integral and we have some theorems that help us when we have a work integral or a flux integral so one thing that's important is distinguishing what kind of line integral you have and what you're going to be doing with that one other thing I would say about this too, when you actually do this dot product of f dot t, you get a scalar function. So work integrals can turn into ordinary line integrals. And then in theory, you could go backwards too, but that's generally more difficult to do, to take a function and sort of dissect that and create a vector field from the symbols in the function that you're working on, but generally probably that's not the way you want to go. So usually if I start with a line integral that is of this form, I'm just going to evaluate that the same way we did when we first started. All right, so when I look at these examples over here, one of the most important parts to pay attention to are the differentials. So the first one has a ds differential. So that is just the ordinary line integral that we started with at the very beginning. And so we're going to just parameterize the curve and then substitute in and set up that line integral. One other thing about these examples that we're going to look at here is my curve. I just want to mention a couple of things about this curve. So I have a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin for my curve, but you should notice the direction of the orientation on that. So it's easy to set up a parameterization that goes counterclockwise. You might do x equals 2 cosine t, y equals 2 sine t, and let t go from 0 to 2 pi. But we need the orientation to be clockwise instead of counterclockwise. So there's several ways to do that. Here's how I would do that. So if I want to just start here so that at the point at t equals 0, I'm still here at 2 comma 0. But instead of going upward and around the curve, I want to go downward and around the curve. Really what I want to change there is the y direction. And so if I just put a minus sign in front of my y equation, you can verify that you will get the correct orientation on this curve. So that is the way I would do this. There's more than one way to do that though. So as long as you get an orientation that's clockwise, then that would be fine. All right, so when I set up my integral of f ds, I'm just going to convert everything to t values, so 0 to 2 pi. My f function in place of my x and y, I'll just substitute in my equations from my curve. So in place of x, y, I'll have negative 4 cosine t sine t, and then plus and then in place of x squared, I'll have 4 cosine squared t. And one thing that students sometimes forget about these arc length integrals is that that ds is an arc length differential. So way back when we first did arc length of parametric curves, we talked about using the distance formula as a way to represent that arc length. And so I've got this dx dt, the quantity squared, plus dy dt, the quantity squared dt. So all of this is my ds differential. All right, and then from there, you just want to simplify that. So I'm not going to go through all the integration here. You should go ahead and practice that integration just to make sure you can do that correctly. Uh, you should get 16 pi. OK, so the next two have different differentials at the end. And you might notice, too, that problems 1 and 3 are the same except for the differential at the end. So it's crucial that you pay attention to what that differential at the end is. So problem two is actually written in the form m dx plus n dy, which is one of the forms of the work integral. So I could evaluate number two in pretty much the same way I evaluated number one, just being careful to use the correct differential for dx and dy. But because this is a work integral and I have a closed curve, I should probably think about whether I want to use either fundamental theorem of line integrals or Green's theorem. So for either of those, I'm going to need to check the curl vector. 
All right, so I didn't get the zero vector, so this isn't quite as good of a problem as it might have been if I got the zero vector and I have a closed curve. But I do have a fairly simple k component of curl, so I can think about using Green's theorem here. There is one little thing to be careful about. Green's theorem does indicate that I need a counterclockwise orientation on my curve in order to have this equality. And I don't have a counterclockwise orientation here, I have a clockwise orientation here. So I've mentioned in some previous videos, but I haven't done any problems yet like that, where you can actually use Green's theorem if the orientation is backwards. You know that when you switch the orientation, that's just going to change the signs on all of the dot products. So if I have a clockwise orientation, so I put a little arrow there to indicate clockwise orientation, that will just change the sign, so I can go ahead and use Green's theorem on this, even though I don't have counterclockwise orientation. I do have all of the other conditions met. I have a curve that is simple, closed, and piecewise smooth. My vector field F is continuous and has continuous first partial derivatives everywhere, so on the curve and the region enclosed by the curve. So I can go ahead and use Green's theorem. And so when I do that, I will get negative double integral over the region R, k component of curl is just going to be x dA, and I'm integrating over the region R enclosed by the curve, so that region inside the curve, so I'll be doing that double integral, and like some of the other ones we've talked about, this one, if you think about what this double integral means, you're picking points inside the curve, you're plugging them into the function, getting those function outputs, adding those all up all over the entire region inside that curve, and you've got these partner points with positive x coordinates and negative x coordinates that will exactly balance each other out, and so you should be able to tell that you're going to get zero for this double integral. If you don't see that, then you just set up the double integral, probably using polar coordinates, and evaluate that double integral over the region R enclosed by the curve. All right, for this last one here, there are a couple ways I could do that. I could just do similar to how I did problem one, and then in place of dx, I'll just be putting my dx from my equation of my curve, so dx would be negative 2 sine t dt, so I could do it that way, or I could also think about this as really either a work or a flux integral, and use Green's theorem for that. So the way you would think about that as a work integral, you could think about this as the m dx plus n dy form, just with the n being 0, and so you could use Green's theorem like that. You could also think about this as a flux integral, and so the flux integral is plus or minus depending on the correct orientation of the curve, so we would need to think about that here, m dy minus n dx. So because there's no dy term here, my m dy would be 0 dy minus n dx, so minus negative xy minus x squared, in order to make sure I get what I had before, dx. So notice that these are really two different vector fields here, but when I use Green's theorem and do the calculations for Green's theorem, I'll get the same next step. I'm going to just do the work integral, so that's a little bit more natural probably with the dx written there, and I don't have to worry about all the sign changes and the plus and minus, so I'm going to use this work integral. And so I'm going to calculate the k component of curl for this vector field. All right, so I get 0, 0, negative x, and then again, when I do Green's theorem, because my orientation is clockwise, instead of counterclockwise, we will need to do the negative of the double integral over the region R of the k component of curl. And so when I do that, I will get negative double integral over the region R of negative x dA, and yet again, if you think through what that double integral means, you can tell that you're going to get zero for that answer.